What up, what up, what up, man? The Real Coach JB here live from the Slapdick Studio, I guess you want to call it. Can't wait till I move into this new lounge, Slapdick Cigar Lounge, uh, right here on the premises. Uh, hopefully, it'll be done soon. We're working on it. Uh, it's just about cameras and uh, setup. So that's what's holding us back. But welcome to this Talk That Talk Tuesday. Steve Kim will be joining me. Matt McChesney is going to join in. Um, we're going to talk NFL Super Bowl, the rest of the, you know, how the playoffs ended. Some NBA and boxing, plus the NFL Coach of the Year. And is Russell Westbrook a bitch-made cat? We're going to break that down, plus some more. All brought to you by betonline.ag. Use the promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V. Get you 50% off welcome bonus. Plus, Canadips, CBD.com. Head on over to Canadips. The cleanest way to dip, go get you some, CanadipCBD.com. Use the promo code COACHJB, all caps. And uh, if you want a bar built anywhere in your home, Kiona's Builds on Instagram, Q-U-I-N-O-E-Z-B-U-I-L-D-S. Kiona's Builds on Instagram, the greatest bar builder on the West Coast. Make sure you fall in and check in with him. If you need a bar or cabinets or anything built, he will do it. We're going to get into this Jeffree Star weirdo fuck. We're going to get into him hanging out with an NFL player. Plus, Wes Russell Westbrook. Uh, going to show a little video about him. What about John McEnroe and Chris Fowler arguing in the booth? No LeBron, no AD. Kyrie scores 26 to beat them. I'm going to break that whole theory down, too. Why isn't LeBron playing? I'm going to tell you why. Also, the Bengals' Pratt now is talking about he regrets what he said about the Osiah penalty uh, on Patrick Mahomes. Why aren't you just keeping with your conviction? Why are we changing our mind now? Why are you sorry now? Because you saw him crying? Come on, man. Can't wait to get this going. Um I will see you guys on the other side. Don't go nowhere right after this intro. Uh, I got a great one in store. Steve Kim will join us in the first hour. I'll see you in a second. Peace. I'm over here talking to TikTok uh, live while the video showed. I had to tell him, you know, you need, you guys need to come on over to uh, YouTube because you guys will kick, you guys will get me kicked off TikTok because I cuss too much because a lot of you BMKs uh, make me cuss you out and then I get kicked off. You know what I mean? So, got to get into that. I'll try to keep it clean for the first little uh, few minutes here and then I'll get off. Everybody on TikTok, come on over um, to uh, YouTube. Become a member if you're not. I got a Discord, TikTok. We don't really want you in there. Um, but if you guys want to come on over to our Discord, Slap Nation, the best $2.99 you can spend. You can chat with us, talk with us, text with us. We don't want none of you cats on TikTok in there. But um, just so you know, we got a Discord. Um, radio Road next week in Phoenix for the Super Bowl. I'll be attending. I got to do a couple radio uh, engagements and speaking engagements uh, in the Super Bowl. I'll be hanging out with my main man, Pat Perez, and then we'll we'll, we'll be hanging out, and then I'll be back because I'm hosting my own Super Bowl party on Super Bowl Sunday. So that's kind of what it is, uh, what's going on right now in the JV world. Uh, quote of the day, let's get you started. Be yourself is the worst piece of advice you can give to some people. <laughs> hey, that ain't no lie. Be yourself. Hey, man, just be yourself. That's some of the worst damn advice you could give to somebody. Because most of you cats, being yourself is why we're screwed up in the world. You don't need to be yourself. You need to be like my ass or someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Being yourself is horrible advice. I just wanted to throw that out there. Be yourself is some of the worst advice you can give to some people. Contrary to belief, uh, brought to you by betonline.ag. Use the promo code believe, B-L-E-A-V. Um, contrary to belief, I've learned so much from my mistakes. I'm thinking about making some more. I'm thinking about making some more damn mistakes so I can teach you youngsters how to recover. Contrary to belief, common sense is like deodorant. The people who need it most never use it. And sarcasm is not an attitude. It is an art. Let that be known. Contrary to belief, everyone has the right to be stupid. But most of you are abusing the privilege. Contrary to belief. Everyone has the right to be stupid, dog, but a lot of you cats out here are abusing the privilege. I'm being real with you. I'm being straight real with you. You cats are abusing the stupidity privilege. I'm just being real. Some of you cats, dog, are so privileged by hiding behind TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. You guys are abusing the dumb, stupid privileges that we all have. We all do stupid shit here and there. We're all slapdicks. But damn, you guys are abusing the slapdick privilege. You're now becoming fucksticks and shitbirds. We already know the deal. TikTok, come on over to uh, YouTube live, uh, the Coach JB show. Um... Man, that's real talk right there, dog. That's a way to start the morning off with a bunch of real talk banter. Whole question, who wins the Super Bowl? You got KC, you got Philly. Who you got? Um, Shauna Salisbury and I broke down Jalen Hurts last night. Kind of what I showed you with the ball mechanics and his and his, and his his kind of how his platform is, his delivery compared. Then we showed Patrick Mahomes. We're going to show Joe Burrow tomorrow. We got this great film right after the the playoffs ended. We got the film. We got to show it yesterday. It is up on YouTube on Last Chance Q. So go check it out on the channel, on my channel, and watch last night's edition of Breaking Down Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes. You can catch that. Um, You can catch that live on uh, YouTube. It's up and running right now. Sean Salisbury and I broke that down. Um, Russell Westbrook acts like a BMK, man. If you don't know what that means on TikTok, it means bitch made cat, which a lot of you are. Uh, or does he? Uh, I'm going to break that down. Uh, if you haven't seen this. Please. ignoring his fans. Russell, can you please stop my jersey? Please, Russell. Please. You're my third player. Please, Russ. I'll show it again. Russell ignoring Russ. his fans. Russell, can you please sign my jersey? Please, Russell. Please, Russ. Russ. you're my favorite player. Please, Russ. Um, the kid said, I'm, you're my favorite player. Please, Russ. I don't know, man. It looked like it was a setup, to be honest. But you know what? Um, two ways to look at it. So everybody's calling Russell Westbrook a BMK. Um... They're saying, you know, he don't even look at the kid, address the kid. All he had to do was sign his jersey. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how to look at it, dog. It's like, where was it? When was it? Um, if you don't want to be seen or address the public or the people that pay your salary, which are those fans, then your management team and surrounding circle needs to do a better job in getting you in the hotel, like through the back, through the back, like everyone else that is a celebrity high profile does. So they don't see the public and deal with paparazzi, et cetera, et cetera. So if you don't want to be seen or look like an idiot, then you, you go around the back. They take you through the chef's quarters or the kitchen or the back elevator. Trust me, I know those things exist. They do that for high-profile people. LeBron, you don't see that much walking through the front of a hotel room. 
because they take them through the back. If that was the case, then don't show up through the front door. So I don't know when it was, all right? Obviously, if it was somewhere accessible, then, dog, it's a bad look on you because this is what we are. We're in the PCS uh, era. Everyone's soft. Everyone thinks you have to do everything they want. So I, 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 I really don't care that he didn't sign it, but I try to always show kids love, especially if the kid's saying you're my favorite player. But it just it sounded set up. I don't know why it sounded set up. I don't know what it would benefit him for. It wouldn't benefit. He's gonna he's taking heat right now for being a BMK. I don't know what the deal is, but truth of the matter, go through another route. Ray Guns said, do you talk to any of the indie players? Well, everyone let him know that he can go back and watch 10 different players I've had on this show. Um, it's Talk That Talk Tuesday, man. I'm going to talk. You know I'm going to talk. You can talk. I'm going to talk back. Um, We're gonna see. We're gonna see what's going on. We're gonna see what's going on here. Um, Jeffrey Star. I don't know who that is. I found out who he was yesterday. Uh, people sit, kept sending me this guy, Jeffrey Star. Jeffrey Star. I have no idea who he is. Um, and I'm like, who the hell is Jeffrey Star? And um, it's this weirdo cat. Holy shit, who is that? Who is that cat? Um, who in the hell is that? Apparently, he is going around saying that he's got a 6-6 NFL player who's not in the playoffs. Um, I guess. He's dicking down or something. I have no idea what's going on with this cat. I don't know anything about him. Lucy, I don't know nothing about this cat. Apparently, though, there's all kind of TikToks and Instagram videos and posts and, and Twitter posts that he's hanging out with um, an NFL player. And I'm pretty sure that we know one of them is probably – or an NFL star, they said. It could be a coach or a player. I don't know any NFL coaches 6'6". Six, six. Player-wise, there's all kinds. But uh, apparently he has a picture of his shoes. He has a picture of uh, all this different stuff. Well, I'm pretty sure it's Carl Nazib. That's just what I've been hearing from a few of my friends. <laughs> a few of my friends. That's the guy that came out openly gay for the Raiders last year. He got traded. Now he's with Tampa Bay. Uh, he's about six, 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 seven defensive end. Um, but I'm pretty sure he would come out and just say it. Right. Cause I, I think he's openly gay. I don't think anyone cares. Right. So I, I don't know. I don't know who it would be. A lot of people thought it was Cliff Kingsbury, Lucy. I don't know why. <laughs> I thought it was Cliff Kingsbury from a lot of what people were saying. Aaron Rodgers ain't 6'6", six, six, brother. Not even close. Uh, but who knows what that means, dog? I don't really care. I don't really care. Uh, it is what it is. Um, but, you know, Cliff was in... Uh, Cliff was over in Thailand, you know? Was over in Thailand and... Uh, you know, TikTok, if you're, you're asking me about Justin Fields and Bryce Young, man, you got to come over to the show, dog. I... I've been talking about that for a while. We broke it down yesterday on the show. I've, I broke it down with the NFL players, too. So you guys can come back and watch the show. Uh, so, look, they got they got this uh, video out there where these white cops are beating up this white dude. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, pretty disturbing. Where's the gun at? Get on the ground. Do a fucking ground. Do a fucking move. Back the neck. Hit him in the head. Where's the gun at? Let me see your fucking head. Where's the fucking gun? I don't know what the deal is. That's two white cops beating up a white dude. We just saw five black cops beat up a black dude, killed him. 
um, unfortunate. Uh, that's just unfortunate about America right now. We're all screwed up. But they say, where's the gun? Show me the gun. So obviously they went in there with intent to take a gun away from a guy. So I don't know, man. I'm from Compton, dog. I, I've never seen a cop go up and ask for a gun gently and nicely. And anyone that's cops that have been in the or armed forces or anything that's in the chat, you don't walk in there hoping he don't have a gun and hoping he gives it to you like handle uh, barrel first. I mean, uh, handle first, right? Like, come on, man. I, I, dog, I don't know, man. I'm just saying. If this cat had a gun and you're going in to take it, I'm pretty sure you're going to go in there with some force. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're going to go in there with some force. So I'm not saying it's close. I'm not saying it's close. See, you guys heard a trigger word or something. Uh, bad week for cops, though. Um, I'm not saying that's close to the uh, to the black cops beating the black kid. Uh, that's not what I said at all. I don't know. Did anyone hear me say that? Like, some of you fucks don't listen, dog. God damn. Some of you just want to talk. Some of you just want to talk. Has nothing to do with what I said. Austin Middaw, Middaw, whatever your name is. Who said it was close or similar? Let me, rewind. Let me rewind. <laughs> Bad week for cops. Uh, two white cops beat up a white cat. I want to talk about it. They were asking for the gun. When did I say it was the same? God damn, some of you dick writers are unbelievable. TikTok, come on over to uh, YouTube Live. I'm on here live. I'm going to start cussing out folks, so come on over and uh, come on over to the YouTube channel, man. It's called the Coach JB Show. Slap dick. Come on over. Peace. Um, some of you dumb fucks are unbelievable. Who the fuck compared that to the black guy dying? See, some of you dick riders just want to come in here and... Man, I was on Coach AB show. And he cussed me out. So you can post, you're going to post a video about that on TikTok. <laughs> um, I got a lot to discuss, dog. I got, who the fuck is this weirdo fuck, though? I got to be honest. Who is this weirdo fuck? Um, I don't even know who that is, Jeffrey Starr. I have no fucking idea who that is. Um, but what a fucking joke Steph Curry and his wife Aisha who by the way spoke out about social injustice while they were endorsing Joe Biden in 2020 but if you haven't followed Aisha and Steph Curry it's funny and ironic now they don't want to see affordable housing built Anywhere near their $30 million mansion. Oh, how funny is that? How fucking funny and convenient is that, Steph Curry? See, that's why I don't fuck with none of these fake motherfuckers, man. That's why I do not fuck with these fake-ass cats. They want to come out and talk about social injustice and da-da-da-da-da. Well, I don't see you getting the homeless off the fucking street, and I don't see you talking now about, hey, man, build up. Build the homeless, build affordable housing, put it right up to our backyard. You don't want them motherfuckers by your house. So now you've made a statement. You don't want to see affordable housing built anywhere near your $30 million mansion. How fucking convenient. It's so convenient to speak out about social injustice in 2020 when we want to get a new president. But now when they start talking about making affordable housing near your fucking house, you renege. Now you're reneging on the whole thing, huh? See, that's fake fuck 101. Fake fuck 101. A lot of you motherfuckers don't understand that shit. You all look up to these motherfuckers. You pay their salary. And then guess what they do? Load manage. Come out with bullshit like this. I ain't never seen the motherfucker. You know who I saw used to used to take care of the homeless? Dennis Rodman. 
I've seen it personally. I've seen this motherfucker take dudes out of a club at the house that was outside the club, took them home. Motherfucker would let, let them stay at his house for like two weeks. Fucking shave, shower the motherfucker. Like, I've seen Dennis Rodman do that multiple times. He used to pull him off Skid Row in L.A. after practice, after games, all the time. I ain't never seen Steph Curry do no shit. By the way, Rodman didn't make anywhere near the money these motherfuckers are making. But, you know, it is what it is. More NFL controversy continues to hit. Uh, videos are being made showing certain things. Uh, take a listen to this video about the catch, uh, the Eagles' first drive when they score. Um, take a listen. Fell allows a fraudulent touchdown in the first drive of the game of the NFC championship. That is so massively bad. I don't care what anybody says. The league needs to address the fact that they drop the ball all the time. They have the CYA guys, everybody's this, everybody that. They gave up a fraudulent touchdown in the first drive of the NFC championship. That was frustrating in and of itself. Now, Watching the game, I would have challenged it right away. And I would have challenged it because Devontae Smith was giving, got up and ran and was giving the on-the-ball signal. He was, he was clenching his two fists together. He was showing Jalen Hurts. He was showing the whole team, get on the ball, get on the ball. No receiver calls that. That's never done <laughs> by a wide receiver. It doesn't exist. And he's doing it because he knew that he didn't catch the ball. So that was the clue to me. Like, this, there's no way he caught it. We haven't seen the right replay yet. But nobody else seemed to, to say anything, at least on the 49ers defense. They got up and beat the system. The system, you shouldn't be in place to beat the system. How many times do you see teams get up on the ball and the refs blow the whistle or they try to snap it real quick because they know they got away with one? That, that shouldn't be part of the game. The game should be, we're going to get the call right, especially in the game that determines who goes to the Super Bowl. That started off the game in, in a bad manner. And then to come back and see it, it wasn't a catch at all. Obviously, great effort, but it was a great effort for a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've been seeing bad referees uh, for a long time. First of all, first and foremost, um, the Bengal game was worse officiated. It was very bad. Plus, Tony Romo made it even worse with the actual announcing of the game. Sean Salisbury and I dove into that last night. Um, the issue is you, you got these horrible games by horrible referees, all the naysayers and fans who know they can do the job better. Of course, the Walmart workers can always do the job better. They can coach better. They can play better. They can referee better. Number one, let's start there. Number two, the NFL, a huge conglomerate in this in this world. At one point, they were the number one conglomerate in the world years ago. They even were topping Exxon, uh, which basically owns the gas and oil. They were topping them one year. Then they that one year they were ahead of automobile industry, which is kind of faltered. They were above Walmart one year. Walmart was number one a couple back in the day. Then Amazon. NFL is always in the top as far as the number one most watched single event of all time every single year super bowl single most watched event every year and uh you have part-time part-timers working the game the referees are fucking doctors lawyers teachers and whatever else how about all this fucking all these billions of dollars you're making how about you hire Full-time fucking referees. And guess what you do in the offseason? You clinic them. And they clinic high school referees. And they clinic youth Pop Warner referees. And they go around teaching younger referees how to become good referees. How about we hire full-time referees? Aren't they, isn't the NFL the bar setter? Aren't we the trend setter? Aren't we everyone looks up to us as players, coaches, trainers, Everybody looks to the NFL. After that, everything shit goes downhill. 
it doesn't make sense when you go to your job as a regular human, right? I'm not saying regular humans are bad. I'm just saying it. When Johnny goes to J.C. Penny Warehouse and the manager is the referee, Ed Hockley, who we've all known from the NFL being the guy with all the big arms and the guns, workout guy, always wanted it about him. He was always on camera. He wanted to fucking make sure everyone saw his arms. Now his son is refereeing. Well, fuck, dog. Hey, Ed, what's up, man? I see you. So now this motherfucker's at JCPenney Warehouse all year long in, in the offseason, and then he's an NFL fucking referee during the fucking NFL season, and we wonder why NFL refs are shitty? Because they're part-time. How about you pay them full-on salaries, and then you could fire these motherfuckers? How about you fire them for bad performance? You grade them out. And, I, and I'm not saying the NFL doesn't grade them, just like NCAA grades referees every single week. I know Craig uh, Craig Helsler, he's a he's a head of the referees. He's been doing it a long time. He's a good dude. Um, I'm good friends with this guy. Good dude. He graded his guys out. He did a hell of a job. He's refed a lot of D2, D1, JUCO. Uh, just so you guys know, I don't know if you guys understand, but arena football, CFL, XFL, USFL, JUCO, D2, D1, all share refs. I don't know if you knew this. See, the, na the, the, the naysayer out there won't know this. A lot of you fucks won't know this. I used to have a lot of refs in JUCO games that are also on Saturdays at the USC game, ref in the game. Or when I played arena football, I had referees in that game that were co the referees at the USC and UCLA game. Or CFL, which is a different season, seasonal. XFL and USFL, spring season sports, have the same refs that are at D1 and some NFL refs. There is a referee shortage. There's been a referee shortage, and there's a definite referee shortage on quality refs. <laughs> so just understand. But that is where we are. Uh, no LeBron, no AD. Kyrie scores 26. They beat the Lakers. Uh, so I got a conspiracy theory. Oh, it's not a conspiracy theory. I'm I'm a thousand percent right because I just know these bitch made cats and how they operate. All right. Um, seems like everything's watered down nowadays, don't it? Um, I gotta I gotta I gotta I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a something to think about some of you may have thought about it already and some of you may have thought about it in a completely different manner and you're going to be like oh fuck that's a different thought let's keep it 100 and be real lebron's not playing right now um he's missed i think the last two right since boston when he got fouled and did a fucking prayer on the fucking court for two hours and shit all eyes on me. Watch me pout and bitch and moan because I flop anyway. So let me now. Maybe the ref said you're a flopping bitch. And we don't know if you're serious or not. Have you thought of that, LeBron? Have you ever thought, LeBron, that you're a flopping little bitch? And maybe the refs are like, ah, this motherfucker's flopping. Fuck him. I'm not calling this foul on his ass. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of that? Maybe you thought of that. Have you thought of that? Oh, okay. Maybe you didn't think about that. So, having said that, why isn't he playing? Oh, he's hurt, coach. No, he's fucking not. He ain't fucking hurt. You want to know why he's not playing? Because he wants to calculate the arena. He breaks Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's scoring record in. Let's just keep it real. Let's keep it real. He's calculating which arena he's going to break the record in. Please understand that, okay? So, the difference between him and Kobe is this. Kobe would have fucking played in these games just to get the scoring record on someone else's fucking floor. 
He would have scored. He wanted to break the record in New Jersey on the Nets floor or in Brooklyn or whatever, or on the Knicks floor or on the fucking Celtics floor. You know, damn well, Kobe would have fucking broke the record on the Celtics floor if he could. This motherfucker wants to go around and fucking calculate where the fucking arena is going to be where he fucking breaks the record. They play in Cleveland anytime soon? I'm curious. I haven't even looked at it. I haven't watched basketball all year. Fuck. So where do they play at the next few games? Because he can get it apparently versus like OKC or he's not far away, right? He's not far off the record. Anyone know what the score is? Does anyone know what the score is? Does anyone know where his points are? How many points is he away? How many points is he away? Because I'm curious. Because didn't we once play the game to play the game? And wherever the fuck you do and break what's record, it happens to be wherever the fuck it was. I'm just curious as to where where we get to pick and choose this motherfucker. I, I'm telling you, you fans. And, and, and Brooklyn's arena was fucking empty. Brooklyn's arena was fucking empty. It was empty. You realize that, right? It was empty. He needs 117 points. Well, he could have scored 30 the other, last night against a team that has no K- KD, no fucking, they're, they're down a bunch of players. So are the Lakers. Nobody was in the arena. Nobody came because no LeBron, no AD, no KD. So nobody got. Nobody even showed up to watch that game, even though, and, and you know, Kyrie's hated by most anyway. So nobody came to see him. He had 26. Nobody gives a fuck. Like, why don't you just play the game and fucking wherever you break the record, you break the record, dog. It's in the history books. Break the record. So, like, dog, I'm just curious. Like, he's a bitch. He's a bitch-made cat. Stop fucking trying to pick and choose where you fucking score and play at. I'm just saying. The Bengals Pratt, the guy that I showed the video of yesterday who came out and was like, man, why the fuck you hit hit, uh, Mahomes out of bounds? Why you fucking have to touch the quarterback? Has now came out and says he regrets reactions to Osaya penalty. He react he regrets his actions and regrets what he said. No you don't. Keep that shit 100 homie like you all say. You said it because you cared and you were pissed off that he did some dumb shit. But now you've seen him crying on the sideline. ESPN showed him crying. Oh, he cried. Now you have to be PC about everything. And now apologize? What the fuck, dog? Keep the shit real, homie. I was just, I was just pissed we lost. That's what you should have said. You know what? I'm pissed we lost. And you did some dumb shit, homie. I know you would have said the same shit if I did that shit. You cannot do that shit next year, Osai. Or we're gonna fuck you up in the locker room after the game. Cool? All right, cool, dog. Good looking out. I'll see you next year in off season. <laughs> That's the conversation we used to have. Now you got to come out and say, "Oh man, I regret I regret walking in the locker saying, "Fuck you, fuck you got to hit him for, motherfucker." Like now you're sad and you're regretting that video? You're regretting that video? What the fuck? Dog, we're so pussy soft, man. It, it, it fucking blows my mind. Apologize now? For having a real life reaction to a game that you lost in the last seconds to go to the Super Bowl? Now you're regretting what you said and did because it was on camera? Man, get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Hey, homie, you can't do that shit, dog. You would have been, you should have been mad. If I did it, I would want you to be mad at me too. You can't do that shit. Next year, dog, if you do it and you're still on the same team, we're going to fuck you up. Uh, That's what the shit should have said. That's what the real conversation should have been. That's what it used to be. And you know what? 
we would have had a drink together still and kicked it and played cards and did whatever the fuck we did. Guarantee you, there was going to be no beef. We're just telling you, dog, we're going to fuck you up next year if you do that shit. And you should fuck me up too if I did it. Because that was some dumbass shit. And by the way, you almost broke your fucking leg in half. But we don't do it. We don't do it. Luca scores 53 points while talking shit to the Pistons assistant coach. See, Larry Bird would have just told you what he was going to do. And then he would kill your players. He wouldn't have talked to no coach. Because he would have had respect for our forefathers and the elders that are on the sideline, which were the coaches. Just so you know. He would talk shit and be silent assassin. He would tell you before the game, hey, dog, I'm going to score 50 on your ass. You know that, right? He would have been like, hey, dog. I just scored 50 on your ass. And then he wasn't saying nothing else. Luca over here talking to the Pistons assistant coaches last night on the sideline. I don't know if you've seen this or heard about it, but he's over there whispering and talking shit to the Pistons uh, staff. These motherfuckers got no respect, dog. These young cats. And it, I've talked about it yesterday. It blows my fucking mind that a lot of you motherfuckers love Luca. You think Luca's the best thing going. And even if you don't think he's the best thing going, guess what? He scores 50 more than anyone else in the NBA. He goes and scores 50 more than anybody in the NBA. And a lot of you motherfuckers on TikTok and on Twitter and all these things, I keep seeing that Larry Bird couldn't play in this era. And I'm sitting there like, hold up. So Luka could play in this era because he is, and he's scoring 50 on you fucking so-called best athletes of all time. But Larry Bird couldn't play in this era. That blows my fucking mind. That just shows the ignorance of how fucking dumb you guys are. Because if you think Luka's a better athlete than Larry Bird, you're out of your fucking mind. If you think Luka's better than Larry Bird, you're out of your mind. But we already talked about this yesterday. Um, Liv's plea... To subpoena the Augusta members is denied by a judge. I don't know if you know, uh, Joe Accord might know. He's a live golfer fan, uh, golfing fan in general. The live apparently tried to get Augusta um, to allow them to play in the Masters. And then they subpoenaed the members from Augusta. Um, and it was going through trial and the judge denied it. Of course they did. Augusta's Masters is too powerful. The Masters people are super powerful. You know damn well that wasn't going to happen, especially with a Saudi group on the outside um, being a foreign entity. There's no way they were going to let that shit slide, dog. Um, Liv is in Saudi this week. They're going to play in Saudi for the first event, and then they're going to get after it. They'll be back here for a couple weeks off, and then they're in Arizona. Um Is Kellen Moore the right fit for Justin Herbert? We're going to get into that with Matt and Steve Kim. And then Mike McCarthy's taking over as the OC. How does that fit with Dak? See, McCarthy wanted to be the OC when he took the job, just so contrary to everyone's belief. He wanted to be the OC in Dallas. Just so we're clear, he wanted to be the OC in Dallas. But he was like, I'm going to keep it comfortable for Dak. We'll keep Kellen Moore. Whoop de whoop. Apparently, he went into Jerry Jones. Is like, look, dog, I can win. I'll call the plays just like I did with Aaron Rodgers, just like I did when we won the Super Bowl, and let me have it. And Jerry Jones is going to let McCarthy have it, and he's going to die on his sword right here because if he don't win something big, which is probably a Super Bowl, Dan Quinn is going to be the new head coach. That's why he signed an extension. That's why Dallas's defense is pretty damn good. Dallas's offense wasn't, even though they were the fifth or fourth in scoring, third in scoring. I don't know. That's smoke and mirrors to me. They really didn't fucking play nobody um, towards the end of the season when they scored 30 points. They scored, and then they fucking lost. I, I They put up some points on Philly um, without Hurts. I don't know... Um, how this is going to end for McCarthy. Um, 
I, I've talked to some people who actually like the Kellen Moore hire with the Chargers and Justin Herbert. This is why I don't like it. I think Kellen Moore is pussy. I think he's too soft. I don't think he's challenging his QBs who make millions, who are NFL quarterbacks. I don't see this big-time money-making quarterback challenged anymore. I don't see him challenged. I want to see the motherfuckers challenged, dog. I want to see these cats challenged. I want to see him challenged. I want to see quarterbacks challenged. If you throw a pick in a double coverage on the sideline like Dak did in the playoffs versus the Niners, I want to see Kellen Moore coming over there motherfucking him. Why not? You make fucking 50 million, homie. Fuck you doing? Cooper Rush, who makes 900000 or whatever, he wouldn't have thrown that fucking ball. But we don't do it. Motherfucking Kellen Moore ain't even nowhere to be found. He won't even come address Dak Prescott. I would have been motherfucking that dude. But we don't do that shit. We don't fucking do it no more. And it's like, dog. And I, I'm, I'm answering a couple questions in this chat. Someone said, would you coach in the NFL earlier? I just saw. No. Fuck no. Why? They make, they're, you're never going to make as much as the player. And when that happens, we're, there's no hierarchy, dog. Hierarchy is player empowerment. The players run the show. And I, I'm like Sean Salisbury, fuck player empowerment. If there ain't no hierarchy, there's no fucking order, then you have issues. Wonder why the America's all fucked up right now. You got no hierarchy. <laughs> You got no fucking hierarchy. I would choke the fuck out of Dak Prescott or one of these motherfucking prima donnas. You imagine me in Arizona with Kyler Murray? You imagine me taking that gig? You imagine me taking that gig? I take over in Arizona with with fucking Kyler Murray? Dog, we would be on... We would be fucking uh, on on ESPN every day. I'd be on ESPN every motherfucking day. I would be choke slamming this fucking mental midget, dog. You know how many times? <laughs> oh, dog. Could you imagine that show? Oh, shit. You imagine Hard Knocks with me on Hard Knocks and that bitch made cat? Oh, that shit would be the motherfucking. That would be the. The highest watched show in the history of cinema television. That would be the single most watched show ever. Garen fucking T. Me choke fucking the mental midget every day on hard knocks. <laughs> oh, shit. Or the Mormon MILF hunter. I would be dragging the Mormon MILF hunter fucking bitch ass all around that motherfucker. I mean, dog, this just like Baker Mayfield. You imagine me? I would choke the fuck out of Baker Mayfield and tell him motherfucker go do another fucking commercial. Like, dog, these cats aren't calling these motherfuckers no more. But it is what it is. What do I know? What the fuck do I know? I don't know shit. Here's the Philadelphia Eagle fans, um, if you haven't seen them. <laughs> Some motherfuckers are... Dog, what did I say earlier? I think I said... Uh... I think I said everyone has the right to be stupid, but some of you motherfuckers are abusing the privilege. That's that's about right. That's about right. Some of you motherfuckers have, you, some of you guys have the right to be stupid, but a lot of you motherfuckers are abusing the privilege, dog. I'm going to be honest. A lot of you motherfuckers are abusing the privilege. I'm going to be honest. You guys are abusing the privilege like I've never seen. Like I've never fucking seen before. Um, I got to be honest. 
I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a Kellen Moore guy. I'm not. Um, now, does he does he do does he have a good year with Justin Herbert? Maybe. I, I mean, the Chargers have a great roster. It's not like the Chargers have a shit roster. So they 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 have a fucking roster, and he might get there and say, "Fuck, Justin Herbert understands what I'm doing. He fucking knows the protections." He knows where who's hot, who's not. He can get the ball out. Maybe Justin Herbert thrives in his offense. Maybe they have a great year. I'm not saying he's not going to have a great year. I'm not saying he's going to be shitty there. I'm just saying I'm not a Kellen Moore fan, and I think Justin Herbert needs someone in his ass. Justin Herbert needs to get their team to the playoffs and win a playoff game and become this elite guy because if not, he's falling below – the Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes tier. Right now, you have to put Mahomes and and, Mah- and Burrow in top tier A because Mahomes been to three out of four Super Bowls. Burrow's been to two AFC title games in a row and a Super Bowl. He's three and one versus Mahomes. He's three and zero oh versus Josh Allen. He, you have to start putting these guys in order. I believe Trevor Lawrence is in second tier. I believe uh, Allen's in the second tier. I believe there's only like four top tier guys. I believe it's Rodgers, Brady, Burrow, and Mahomes. Because I tell you, Mahomes makes plays, even though I believe they're gimmicky. I believe Andy Reid saves him more often than not in the call, in the scheme. We broke down a little bit of Mahomes last night. Um, But you know what? He got the ball out. He understands where he's going. We broke that down. We're going to break down some more Mahomes this week. And I always tell you, skill set, results, and how you are. Mahomes played. He fucking didn't bitch out. He fucking won. He's in another Super Bowl. Mahomes checks all my boxes, dog. Even though I think he's gimmicky. Even though I think this and that. And I'm I'm on record. I say what I say. The, I've always said he's talented. I've always said he's a fucking dude. I always said he has great skill set. I just said he's gimmicky. And I said I want to see him away from Andy Reid. And I want to and I say don't anoint him the fucking greatest thing ever. That is all I say every day. And I'm not changing ever. Not changing anything I say. But he is in the top tier of quarterbacks with Burrow, Rodgers, and Brady right now. Second tier, I'm putting Trevor Lawrence, Josh Allen, Herbert. um, Fuck, dude. Quarterback play is bad, dog. Quarterback play is so fucking bad that, I mean, where's Lamar Jackson? Where's Kyler Murray? Where's fucking Dak Prescott? Where's fucking Derek Carr? Where's Geno Smith now? Where is um, Tua? Where are these guys? Because I'm telling you, quarterback play is bad in the NFL. It is very, very bad. Jalen Hurts threw for 122 yards the other day. He wasn't the reason they won the football game, contrary to belief. Like, I've never seen a motherfucker throw for 122 yards and lead their team to the Super Bowl. Jalen Hurts is 21-2 and two as a starter. He's fucking 16-1 and one as a starter this year. It is a different game, uh, Ren. It is a different game. I'm not saying it's not. All I'm saying is the bottom line is still when you break down film and watch it, you still see that this guy, these aren't the same cats that I grew up watching. These ain't the same guys. They don't know where the fuck they're going with the ball. Mechanically, they're all fucked up. They're shitty. They don't know where fucking what is what. They don't know nothing. They're just more fucking gifted, more athletic. And now coordinators and head coaches have to call games to surround their talent and make it a a game to condu- that's conducive for their success. They got to make sure that we put Mahomes in the right situation. Look, dog, we broke down yesterday's Chief game a little bit. If you watch the first quarter, 
They ran two hook and ladders, two shovel passes, and an underhand fucking whip route throw. And that's not, I'm not talking that, I'm not putting that bad on Mahomes. What I'm saying is Andy Reid don't give a fuck. He's running gimmicky ass shit in the first quarter. Two fucking hook and ladders from Kelsey. To, he threw one incomplete one, and then he had another one set up. He chose to keep the ball. And then they, Mahomes threw two underhand shovel passes, and then everything else from there was he threw a wheel route that was dropped for a touchdown. He threw a hitch ball on time, and he threw that hook and ladder to Kelsey over the middle. What I'm saying is it is different, but understand, they don't give a fuck. Andy Reid don't give a fuck. He's calling his offense in the middle of the first quarter, and they're tied 0-0. He's running fucking hook and ladder. Let that resonate with you. He don't give a fuck. Mahomes is being put in a system that is best for him and his skill set. Mahomes' skill set ain't drop back, read coverage, throw the ball on time, throw it over the middle. That's not what they do. They do gimmicky shit on offense. That is one reason why it is either a, a curse or a privilege, right? People say or whatever they say. That's one reason Eric Bieniemy don't have a job. That's one reason Eric Bieniemy will not get a head job. Nobody wants to talk about that. So here, here, let me break down this fucking Eric Bieniemy thing for everybody. So since all you fucks know everything. Let me break down this thing. Let's break this down. If owners think Eric Vietnamese is indeed the offensive coordinator, all right? Let's just be honest. Let's be honest. If people think that Eric Vietnamese really is the play caller, 100% play caller, all right? Matt McChesney's dead wrong, by the way. Um, Eric Bieniemy does not call plays. But anyway, if Bieniemy was the play caller and half the owners in the NFL know this and they think he's the play caller, look at the offense. Look at what they do. They run gimmicky shit. So if you're an owner, a GM, or anyone with an, an upper brass, what do you sit there and say? All right, this guy's running this gimmicky-ass offense. He's the play caller. We think, all right, we'll interview him. But we don't have Patrick Mahomes. We don't have this ad lib guy who's a, who's got unbelievable athleticism, who's a talented guy. We don't have this guy. So we cannot run this gimmicky-ass shit in Houston. We can't run this gimmicky-ass shit in fucking Carolina. We can't run this gimmicky-ass shit in Arizona. So he don't get a job. All right, let's flip coin the shit. Let's say we know you're not the play caller. Well, now we don't know what the fuck you do. Now we we know Andy Reid's the play caller. You guys run this gimmicky ass shit. Now you're over there fucking doing what? Learning gimmicky shit? So what are you going to bring to my organization? Gimmicky shit? Again, without Patrick Mahomes. Now, if you bring Patrick Mahomes with you, we'll probably hire you. But we don't have Patrick Mahomes. We don't have Kelsey. We got to run regular fucking football plays with the quarterbacks we have. This is more the real reason as to why Eric Bieniemy don't have a job, people. It ain't a black thing. It ain't a white thing. Stop fucking talking about it, Ryan Clark. Stop fucking talking about it, Acho, you fucking weirdo fuck. Talk about the real. You're either gimmicky offensive coordinator, we don't have this fucking personnel to run, so we can't hire you, or you aren't the OC and all you know is gimmicky shit and you're not bringing anyone with you of value, so you're not getting hired. And you're not the play caller, we know it. You are a in a catch-22, my friend. You are in a catch-22. <laughs> you are fucked. 
Zach, stop with the, you hear he's horrible in interviews. Who you hear that from, Zach? Who'd you hear he's horrible in interviews from? Who do you hear he's horrible in interviews from? You know the fucking GM? Do you know the owner? I love hearing when people say, I hear he's horrible in interviews. No, you don't. You hear fucking TikTok say that. You hear fucking Twitter say that. You have never heard from someone else's mouth that means anything in this world when it comes to hiring people that he's horrible. Stop it, Zach. Fuck. Now, come to me. You want to ask me about it? Who talks to Eric Bieniemy? Who talks to guys in the NFL? Guess what? You know why? Let me show you something, man. God damn. We all grew up together out here. So, um, you know, I hope Eric gets a shot, man. I, the people that, you know, they hired to do the Eagles hire. Oh boy, this motherfucker can't even speak on the damn mic. Like, and they're saying Eric don't interview well, like, well, shit, he still deserves a shot to say he failed or he proved himself. Like this dude's getting a shot. He can't even speak. You know, you know, oh, when man. people don't interview well, that means they're not speaking your language. No, that's exactly right. Boom. You hear that? You hear that, Zach? You hear that, Zach? How ironic is that, that I could pull up a fucking clip like this when one of you motherfuckers says some dumb shit? <laughs> How fucking unbelievable is that? How did I have that sitting there in my queue? From a Hall of Famer, Marshall Falk, by the way. Let me guess. You know more than Marshall Falk. <laughs> oh, man. Some of you motherfuckers need to stop fucking believing everything you hear, bro. Some of you need to stop believing every single thing you hear. You don't interview well to these fucking good old boys because you don't speak the language. You don't think I've been told I don't interview well? You know how many times I've been told I don't interview well? You know how many times I've been told I'm the best interview they've ever had? Because it's all about the interviewer. It's not the interviewee. It's who's interviewing. I've been told I'm horrible by certain people after I leave the interview. People are like, man, JB, you're the best by far, but they think you're horrible. Well, no shit. I don't speak their fucking language. Let me ask you something. Zach, knower of all things. I know you spoke to all the owners and GMs at the owners meeting last year in February uh, for the NFL PA. And I know you know all things, but listen, if you walked into Amazon right now and sit down with Bezos and said, hey, listen, I'm interviewing for the COO of Amazon. Zach, we heard you on the Coach AB show. We want to interview you. Do you think you're going to get the job? Do you think you fucking know every single thing that Bezos wants to hear? And I guarantee you, you're probably really good at something in life, right? You're good at something, but it may not be interviewing at Amazon, bro. It may not be interviewing for the head coaching job for the fucking Indianapolis Colts or the Colorado Buffalo or the fucking Kansas City Chiefs or the fucking Houston Texans. Dog, it's each his own. Motherfuckers who are interviewing you are the people that matter. It don't mean you go learn how to fucking, I, 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 people every day are like, coach, how do you interview? I don't know. I'm never changing. I'm not going to Google how to interview either. I'm not going to go look at to how to change my interview style because three people didn't like how I interviewed. Well, I've been a head coach five times. I've been an OC eight times. I've been all over the place. And guess what? I've been hired 13 times by 13 different types of people. So I interviewed fucking great there. And then I haven't got 13 jobs because I didn't interview well, quote unquote. Because the interviewer didn't like what I said or how I said it. The thir 13 jobs that I got, they liked how I said it and what I said. You ain't got to change up and go think the magic is on Google. Let me go Google how to interview. What did I do wrong? 
interview questions. I love when I when I go, you go on Google and and I and I and I used to do this for these clinics. I used to do. You go on Google how to interview for a head coaching job. Go Google that shit right now and pull it up. Commonly asked questions. What do you do when an unruly player walks up? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I choke the fuck out of them. That's what I do, Mr. President. Oh, shit. Coach Brown, we can't have that. And then you know what? Another motherfucker's like, shit, that's what this fucking place needs. <laughs> Perception is reality. Perception is reality. It is about the interviewer and the interviewee. And each one of them is different. I've been in a fucking thousand of them, okay? And you cats go on Google and think that the commonly asked questions for an interview. What happens when two coaches are arguing and the players see it? And then how do you address? Get the fuck out of here. That ain't on Google. There's no Google search for that question. You know what I do, Mr. President? I fucking choke one of them. I fire the other one. And then the one I choked, if he can handle it or not, he can stay and learn. The other one's got to get the fuck out. That's what I do, Mr. President, Mr. Athletic Director. Oh, okay, cool. One of them might hire me. The other one may fire, not hire me. It is what it is. It is what it is. But these commonly asked interview questions... Let's see if I can pull up some interview questions, dog. Uh, let's do a Q and A real quick. Let's let's go. Let's let's interview Coach Brown. How about this idea? I, fuck, I'm just thinking of it right now. Let's 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 pull it up. I want to pull up some interview questions. All right. Let's see. How can I pull it up? Let's see. I want to pull this shit up. Um. Let's see. Zach, I, I, I'm not picking on you. I'm just using you as an example, bro. Don't take it personal. It's not personal. It's all business. <laughs> um, I didn't see what you said. I'm just telling you. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, let me see. All right. This is something that I have. All right, I'm break this down. This is something that I have right here. These are topics that I used to touch on during an interview. All right. These are t- these are shit I used to touch on during an interview. Okay? Let me see. So this is things that I wanted to talk about, okay? Classes and makeup class possibility. I'm asking those questions. I want to know these questions. You know why? I don't give a fuck what questions you ask me. I'm going to answer them my way. But I'm going to ask you questions in summer school layout. Will I have input? Mr. President, rollover. Like, this. these are things you don't know what they mean. This is when you've been a head coach a long time. Uh, there's something called compass testing, and, and which is basically a, uh, you know, a placement test. Uh, meal plans for coaches. Host families for recruiting. Recruiting budgets. Travel and hotel for recruiting. Five off, five on is my goal during the recruiting season as far as coaches. Weight room use and times. Other sources of income for staff. Scholarship possibilities for filmers, trainers, fake referees, spring, fall, summer. Meals for college officials may purchase meals for recruiting during the... So I'm asking all these questions because I want to see their fucking reactions. Because if it's bullshit, I'm not taking the job anyway. I don't give a fuck if you like my answers or not. All right? So I'm asking those questions first. And I say it. I say, listen, can I, can I, I, I need to ask you guys some questions before we move forward with your questions. And they look at me like, you got some uh, balls on you. And I say, respectively, 
I have to ask these questions before you ask me questions, because if you ask me some questions and I ask you these at the end of the questions, regardless if you like my answers to your questions or not, I'm going to walk out of here and we've wasted an hour of our time. So let's not waste an hour of our time. Let me ask you these questions and how you answer them is how I will continue this interview. You know how many times I've done that? You know how many times I've got up and left? You know how many times I've stayed and either got the job or didn't get the job? You know how many times I've been called arrogant and an asshole because I do it that way? You know why, though? Because you need full autonomy to be a great head coach. You have to have buy-in to be a great head coach. It ain't that you're the greatest head coach. It's the buy-in that you have and the people surrounding you that they are all in for the betterment of the good, which are the kids. And then to do with you and your fucking personality, the audacity, the, the ego, fuck that. It is ego. It is audacity. It is balls dropping in your fucking face on an interview. You know why? Because I'm about the kids. And if I can't have these things for the kids that I'm going to go recruit, I'm not selling this school to a parent and lying in their fucking face. But you don't understand that shit. It's way over your head. Y'all think there's this perfect formula to interview. No, there's not. Um, let's go. I'm going to pull up commonly asked coaching interview questions, okay? Oh, dog. <laughs> This might be the best show you've ever been on right here. I should, uh, maybe I'll do this one today. Coaching interview questions with sample answers. Let's pull this up. Oh, oh, guess what? You can get a coaching job on Indeed. You can go on Indeed.com and get how to become a coach, and you'll get the job, people. Oh, shit. Disco dick. Very condescending tone, coach. Have a little respect for the viewers. Shut the fuck up, you dumb fucking cunt. Get your bitch ass out of here, you fucking pussy. Don't come in my motherfucking show then, bitch. All right. Coaching interview questions with sample answers. Love this shit. Why did you want to become a coach? <laughs> Why did you want to become a coach? Oh, you know, one day I woke up and I'm like, fuck it. I want to make $3 million a year. So why not fucking, why not be a coach? Shit. Why not, Mr. President? I don't know. I want to make a lot of fucking money. I want to fucking have a car and a house. And I want to, I want to be on ESPN every fucking day. Well, would you become a coach? <laughs> Are you joking me? So let's be honest. Why do you, why do you want to become a coach? Well, I haven't. I don't want to become a coach. I'm on my 37th interview, Mr. President. I've been a coach for 20 plus years. I've got eight bowl rings. Uh, I've sent 300 kids to Division One. I. I have 28 in the NFL. Eight of those guys won a Super Bowl. I have a fucking Pro Bowl MVP. Uh, I have, I've had the highest graduation rate in junior college football history. I've sent more kids to college in a three-year span, Division One, than any other JUCO coach in America. I have the highest retention rate, the highest graduation rate, and the highest GPA for junior college playing teams ever. That's not why I became a coach, but I've been a coach for 20 years. So I don't want to become one. I want to become a better one. So how do you become a better coach? Well, Mr. President, I want to be your coach. If that's the, that's the correct question you should have asked me. I want to be your coach because I've been researching your institution and your program. And I know what you guys have done. You've kind of fallen on hard times. You struggled 
recently. You haven't got the good kids in. You're getting beat out by school B over here for your kids. They're beating the shit out of you in recruiting. You got to change your recruiting aspect. You got to start knocking down your backyard. You, you're getting beat in your hometown. You're losing kids to outside schools. You got to hold these kids accountable. You got to keep them in. We got to change this culture around here. I love coaching kids. I want to help young boys turn into men. That is why I coach and want to be your coach at this fine institution's fine, sir. That's the answer. There's the answer right there. So there's the answer to why do you want to become a coach? All right. Here's the Indeed example. Oh, I didn't even know they had an example. Here we go. Here's the example to Indeed's question. Well, when I started high school, I was so excited to join the soccer team, but soon felt like I was nowhere near as talented as my teammates. My coach noticed my change in demeanor and pulled me aside. After listening to my concerns, she explained why I should stop comparing myself to others. She outlined the skills I brought to the team and kindly offered suggestions on the areas I could improve. Every few weeks, she checked in on how I was feeling and provided feedback on my progress. By taking the time to coach me on an individual basis, I felt that she cared about me and valued me as a team member. At the end of the season, I had gained confidence that extended both on and off the field. I want to make sure the same positive impact on my players, letting them know I care about their well-being and want to see them grow as athletes and individuals. <laughs> Are you fucking shitting me? And some of you presidents will hire the fucking person that answered the question like that. That's what's crazy. Like, come on. Now we got fake Bruce Helms. Get, dog, you guys are dick writers. Shut the fuck up. So, oh, I mean, come on, dog. Steve Kim joins us. <laughs> Morning. Hey, I, I, I got to do I'm doing this interview thing today, dog, because there's no way. I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there like, I just pulled up a, 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 a Marshall Falk clip that I had when he was on my show, and I'm like, somebody in the chat, some dick writer, was like, hey, uh, you know, they say Eric Bieniemy doesn't interview well. And I said, well, who told you that? Did you talk to the owner? Did you talk to the fucking GM? No, you didn't. You heard it from ESPN. How do they know? They don't know either. And I pulled up the, 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 the clip, and basically, Steve, Marshall Falk, and I – both said the same thing. We're like, well, people say you don't interview well when they don't fucking agree with what you have to say. And, you know, or you don't relate to them. Uh-oh. Uh, Coach, you're coming in and hat on me. Am I? You hear me? You don't hear me? Oh, boy. Hold on. Oh, I hear you now. Now you're back. Damn. I don't know what that is. You yeah, you're kind of glitching there for all. Like, oh, no, not this again. Fuck. Yeah, I, hear you I think it's the three and Cosell's house. You don't hear me? What? <laughs> Are you fucking with me? Um, you can't. Coach, hear me? Now you're glitching up on me again. Let me remove you and pull you back in. Can you guys hear, Steve? I can hear you now. Yes, absolutely. Everybody says they hear me in the chat, so it must be something on the stream end. I don't know. Um, can you hear me? Oh, oh boy! Now you now you're back to being the bubble again. Hey, hey, restart. Uh, get uh, exit and come back. All right, gotcha. Okay. Um, you guys can hear me, right? You guys, are, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's got to be something on his end. He can't hear me, though, so I don't know what that means. Um, yeah, it's got to be his end. You hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It must be something in the in the, the Matrix. <laughs> hey, uh, so I was talking about interviewing, man, and I was like, I did not know that Indeed has interview questions that you could go through. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, come on, dog. Come you on. Know what the, you know what the problem with that is? When you start leaning on that and you get desperate and you get interviewed, you don't start you, – you start to really 
put on an act instead of being authentic. And I, I, I just really think when you interview somebody as a school president or an athletic director, I, I want someone to say, look, I know who you are. Let's cut out the nonsense. Yes. Give me your thoughts. Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Like I'll if you were interviewing team. Bobby Knight, hey, Bobby, um, what do you think about player discipline? I don't want Bobby Knight saying, well, you know, I truly believe in the softer approach. I don't believe in yelling at players or throwing chairs or choking out reporters in the elevator. I'd be like, really? Really? No, I'd rather have Bobby Knight say, listen, I forgot more about this game than you'll ever can know. So why don't you shut up, push your pencils, do your degrees. I'll do the basketball. And I'd be like, you know what, Coach Knight? You're hired. Hey, I, I, just was, doing this. I was doing this mock interview with the, with the chat, and I'm like, I'm like, look, there's 500 people in here. Let's do a mock interview. Like, I love the, what are your core values? What do you do when, when two players are, are disobedient? I choke the fuck out of one of them. I cut <laughs> another one. And guess what? We'll win eight Super Bowls. I, I mean, fuck, I, I've won eight bowl rings doing it that way. And yeah, I, I, mean, I said, some presidents will say, fuck, we need that around here. And the other ones will say, oh, no, no, no. You don't speak my language. Can't do I it. Wish enough, I wish it was honest enough where a coach could say, well, Mr. Chancellor or school president, it depends. Have you ever fired anyone for not winning enough but having too high of a GPA or not enough players graduating? Because you tell me your answer, and I'll tell you what you want because if you want to win, I'm your guy. Now, we might have some problems recruiting once in a while, some probation, but that's minor stuff. Now, are any of my guys going to become road scholars? No, because that's not what you're hiring me for. This whole thing is a dog and pony show. Um, but here's my view. There are times, because of stuff like the Rooney Rule, the, a lot of these interviews do nothing except fill a quota. Let's just call it for what it is. And most teams and programs at least have a general idea of who they want to hire and just want to get to know the guy. But but this is big business. When you start spouting off core values, graduation rates, I mean, look, that stuff's important, but there has never been a coach that won a lot of games that was ever relieved of his duties because, well, we had to get rid of Coach X, Y, and Z. His uh, team grade point average fell below 2.7. It's never happened. It never will happen. It just is not the reality. I've never seen Urban Meyer come in and say, you know what, your coach, you know, I know you've won fucking four national titles, but you know what, your team GPA fell behind the API and the national rankings, yeah. and we got to let you go. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, I, I love the what approach do you take when your team is struggling question on Indeed. <laughs> let me okay. tell you, you don't have a fucking idea, Mr. President, so don't even ask that question. Next. Yeah, it's called, it's called, I coach him up, I cuss at him, I'm tough on him, I'm not a player's coach, because I hate that, because that never really, if you're soft, it never wins, and then we, uh, we that's what we do, it, this is not that complicated, or how do you fix around a, uh, a struggling program, easy, you recruit your ass off, you get better players, that's, what it, it's not, the formula is not really that difficult. Hey, uh, I don't know if you know this guy right here, you know who this fucking weirdo is? Who is uh, Shim? Who is that Shim? Jeffrey or Star or something? Oh, God. Okay. All right, I don't know who Star. Jeez. So apparently he or it or them or whatever the fuck it is, they have a 6'6 NFL player um, that they're screwing, I guess. He's screwing, it's screwing, whatever. And he, it just keeps showing the person like, like his head, his foot. It's not showing him. It's a big old thing on Twitter and TikTok. It's like a big old trending thing. Um, and everyone's like, who is it? And if some people have said it's Cliff Kingsbury. Some nah. people have said that it's uh, uh, John Elway. I've heard crazy shit. Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers. But <laughs> now the guy came out and gave another clue and that it's not, he, that the person's not in the playoffs and he's 6'6". Carl Nazib, right? Hmm. Well, Carl Carl's the one guy that came out last year. I mean, does that does that kind of narrow it down? Well, he's six six. Yeah, so it's not it's not any of the quarterbacks you named, and I never thought it was any of those guys. Um, no, it ain't Cliff Kingsbury. Six six. 
Um, Kingsbury not six six either. Yeah. Huh. By the way, is that a transition player? Uh, is that a girl or a guy? What is that? This thing here? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All I know is I never heard of him until <laughs> so last night when they told me the story. He's got like 6 million followers, and he's a YouTuber. Huh. And I'm like, Amazing. I'm like, never, why? Never saw have... until just now. I'm like, why do you have so many followers? Six million people think you're cool to follow. Gee, that's, really? That's, that's what's fucked up. Um, well, oof. Andy right, Warhol once said it best. Some... Everyone gets their 15 minutes. <laughs> Let me get your take on the Bengals' loss uh, since I haven't talked to you really. Uh, is it referees? Is it Burrow throwing two picks? Is it Mahomes nutting it out on an ankle? What's your take on that game? Well, look, the officiating was terrible, but I, I, I also think Zach Taylor blew that game, Coach. The, the second to last drive, they had second and three after Mixon runs off, rips off a seven-yard run. They're right around, somewhere around midfield. And I'm thinking, you know what? Start to try to run the ball a little bit. It's a tie game. They seem to have all the momentum. You could feel the unease at Arrowhead Stadium. And they call two deep shots or long intermediate passes. And I'm thinking... You know, you got to move the chains here. You got second and three. Look, look, they didn't run the ball well. But there comes a point in time you could wear out a defense late in games. I'm sure you've probably coached in a lot of games where all of a sudden in the fourth quarter, if you pound that run, you start to make some headway. They completely gave up on that. Then you take a look at that last series of drives where they had the ball tied up. They had the ball right around the 40-ish. And – one of those plays, I would have ran a draw or some sort of trap because I thought the Chiefs were in pass rush mode. I wanted to catch them in something. Also, even if you don't run the ball for big yards, you two, two, you do two things. You either force the clock to run, so you squeeze the clock on Mahomes, or you force them to take a timeout. They did neither. So then you punt the ball. And look, there was an obvious clipping on that play, on the gunner, far oh. sideline. And but on coach, the run by Mahomes, too. Right. And, Coach, here's another thing. That punter kicked the ball in the middle of the field. I know shit. He didn't hem the ball in. He didn't corner the ball. When I saw the kick, and so I don't see the trajectory, but when I see the punt returner get right on the like the middle of the hash marks, I said, what the hell type of kick was that? They, coach, look, I'm not saying the Bengals – did not get a raw deal with the officiating. However, um, their own game and clock management left a lot to be decide, desired. And by the way, Osai, that linebacker, that was a penalty. He was obviously oh. out of bounds. It was a dumb play. And I don't get this whole thing that we everyone has to be nice to him. Were people nice to Scott Norwood for the past 30 years who missed the field goal against the Giants for the Buffalo Bills? Look, no one player or one play wins or loses a game. But that was a bad, low IQ football play. As Jimmy Johnson once said, uh, hit me over the head with a baseball bat before I take a dumb player. And I don't like this. Well, he's only 22. And, you know, we got to have more. Get the f I just hate that. Uh, dude. that. That is just virtue signaling. And it's almost like saying we can't criticize certain people. Do your damn jobs. It was a dumb play. Did you see the video of the kid who came out and was like, why the fuck did you push this? Crap. Why did yeah, you he's talk? being honest. Yeah, he's being, being honest. honest. He has well, nothing today, to apologize today for. He came out and reneged. Today he regrets saying Well, it. I mean, obviously he felt the social media pressure. But, Coach, first of all, you know the climate of football. They protect the quarterbacks. You know who they really protect? The star quarterbacks. Hell yeah. And when, and when they start running towards the sideline, I've seen this. They are not treated like wide receivers. Or running back. When a quarterback gets near the sideline, there's almost a gentleman's agreement. Let them step out of bounds. Don't touch them, and it won't be a penalty. There, there's actually a play. I'm just telling you, Mahomes was really out of bounds. That was not even a borderline call. Oh, no, he's three steps out. Right. And so when people are trying to say, well, that's a tough play. Look, if you don't have players that can think the game of football and have a football IQ, they will get you beat. Bottom line.
And I uh, like the fact that the kid Pratt or whatever his name was was talking shit because it's it showed me that that team cared. It had a little old school. It was like, fuck, this is a Super Bowl game. This goes to the Super Bowl again. Why would you do some stupid shit? Like, that's what I took from it. Now, why today? I just, Steve, I just talked about this on the show. I'm like, back in my day, this is what the conversation would have been. Hey, dog, you did a fucked up dumb shit. You did some dumb shit. Now, listen, you cool. You're my boy. But you know, if we're on the same team, if you're still here next year and you do that shit, we're going to fuck you up in the locker room. Just want to let you know. Go full metal jacket. That's just it's what it would be. Hey, dog, we can still go out and hang out and have a drink. You know, you fucked up. It is what it is. I'm not apologizing for saying, why the fuck did you push him out of bounds? No, that's what happened. We cared. We lost. Like, when, is, when did losing become so accepting? Well, Coach, the average NFL career is about three and a half to four years. And every year takes a toll on your body. And it's the sands of time. You t- turn it over. And you don't get that many chances. And when you have a team like that and you lose in that fashion, you really think, man, I don't want to say it's a wasted year, but it's one less year I have to ever reach my ultimate goal of a Super Bowl. Very few guys, maybe the Ray Lewis's, the, uh, you know, Peyton Manning's, they're the ones who play 15, 16, 17 years. But when you're just the average run-of-the-mill blue-collar worker, you get four to five to six to seven. And when you blow it like that, it's an incredible amount of frustration. And I, I, as soon as that flag went up, I said they lost. You could just tell. Oh, yeah, it was They over. lost. Because the punt return should have been a fucking yeah. flip, and the ball should have been starting at the 15, and they would have had to go fucking 75, 80 yards. You know what I mean? That that changed the whole thing. So I, that I ball, know. I'm just telling you, those last two drives, Joe Mixon had to get the ball more. Joe gets overlooked because of all the fireworks on the outside. Joe is a great all-around. He's the perfect running back for that team because you don't necessarily, you're never going to give him 25, 30 carries, but he's a strong inside runner, has really good top end speed, and he can catch the ball. So I'm just telling you, review that drive from second and three on, on the penultimate drive. I said, okay, run the ball once. Just get the first down, flip that clock, keep it going, wear out that defense. And the two deep shots, one of which which was picked off, I was like, I said, ugh, not a fan. I I think Joe Burrow, along with Zach Taylor, they both deserve a little bit of blame. In that situation, sometimes you're not trying to score so quickly. You know, grind the clock a little bit. So, But again, the little things lead to big losses. Um. Man, I got I got some exclusive film. I ended up getting that game uh, already. I got the Eagles game as well. Um, and coach, I saw you in Salisbury yesterday and that elongated, really long release of Jalen Hurts. Um, and he's always a beat off uh, in terms of like getting the ball off on time. If you're the chiefs, do you sell out on the early downs to get him into third and eight, make sure they don't win first down? Yes, I do. Um, there's just there's so many things we were trying to break that down. Like we were trying to break this thing down, and I'm like, dude, they were so people. First of all, let's go back. That game was 14-7. Everyone wants to talk about a blowout with it four was 14, minutes to go in the first 14, half. 14-7. Like this is a game without a quarterback that your D'Amico Ryan's called a pretty damn good game for the most part, even though I know the secondary suspect, but Jalen Hurts throws for 120 yards. He was a god awful uh, throwing the football. And and I, I have to look at it and see, like, fuck, man, we're so, the football is so watered down. I'm like, God damn, it's watered down. It's not very good. Um, I wanted to do something with you today when, before you get out of here. I wanted to show you the, uh, I want to go through that last drive for Cincinnati with 2.30 left. It's a 20-20 to game. We'll do that at the end since I have that film. And and Sean and I haven't talked about or haven't broken it down. So me and Steve Kim is going to be the first one to show you some Burrow film today before he gets out of here. Let me ask you this, uh, Steve. Um, did you see this Russell Westbrook show? Russell, can you please sign my jersey? Please, Russell. Please, you're my third player. Please, Russ. What do you think about that? Is he obligated to sign this kid's fucking thing? Or do you take it as, okay, this kid's paying your salary, whoop-de-whoop? Or do you take it as, 
Because I got a different thing. I'm like, look, if you're a high-profile guy, you go around the back. You go through the kitchen. Your team takes you through other ways if you want to avoid that conversation. I don't see how that helps Russell Westbrook's persona or image, but I don't believe he's obligated to sign it either. So, like, I'm in, I'm in like, just don't go in the front, motherfucker. Go around the back. Okay, you know what's really suspect? I don't think anyone has Russell Westbrook as their favorite player right now. That that right there is suspect. So hey, I'm, that's, I, it looks set up, don't it? That could be a kid being paid by someone on eBay, one of those vendors. Hey, kid, get this guy's audit. And that happens a lot. Here's what, it, it's a bad look because it's one person. It's not like it's a mob. If it's a mob, I get it. You, you got to get sequestered in there. Secret Service ushers you in. It's one kid. Sign you know, it real your, quick, right? Put your John Hancock on it and say, all right, way to go, kid. Get the fuck out of here. You know? Russell Westbrook's his persona already and his reputation is not the greatest. Kind of a prickly personality, if you will. Um, and he treated that like a jump shot. He said, I want no part of that. I just It's a bad look. It's one kid. Um, you know, it's unfair, though, to celebrities. I've... You know, look, I know Mario Lopez, and he always he always has to be on. Like, we'll go to the movies, and he's with his kids, or we'll be eating somewhere, and people just cannot help themselves. Um, you know, Mario's really good about it, because generally he's a people person. But we don't, But to be fair to Russell Westbrook, and I'm not a fan of his, he may have had a terrible day. And you know what, Coach? We're all, we're all allowed to have it. Um, but the fact that it's one kid asking for one autograph. And the other and, guy... The other kid's laughing, and I'm like, eh, it looks set up. Yeah. I mean, we, ne- we don't know. I mean, that guy could have a bag full of jerseys. All right, kid, here's Anthony Davis. Uh, five minutes later, AD, you're my favorite injured player of all time. Can I have your hot I don't know. You know, these guys, are, these guys have all become jaded after a while. But to be honest, I don't blame them either. All right, same with me. Um I mean, I have a different outtake. LeBron's not playing right now. He's he's 117 points from breaking Kareem's record. It, if I, if this was Kobe, Kobe would be playing in everyone's arena, and he wouldn't give a shit where he scored hey, broke hey. the record. He wants yeah. to break the record in Boston or in Brooklyn. He wants to make that yeah. record. You, did LeBron you hear about calculating this, right? There was almost – I heard there was a lot of empty seats. A lot of people didn't show up. The, the NBA has a problem. They created this. Um, the fans are now load managing their own support. And good. I am so glad that Charles Barkley flat out said these guys to me need to be taught a lesson. I can't wait to the next collective bargaining agreement. I know people are saying that Charles Barkley is the old man telling the kids to get off his lawn. You know what? So am I. I'm proud of it. I'm never changing. The NBA deserves this. They have created this apathy, and the, these people, these guys have no respect for the people that pay their. I am so sick and tired, and tired and sick of all these announcers caping up for these guys. They are not working in a coal mine, they are not digging ditches, they're playing a game for exorbitant amounts of money. They travel in luxury. They're not flying commercials. They're not on boxcars. They don't take long-distance Ubers. They get four-star, five-star treatment wherever they go, and they are being asked to play a game, which in the big picture is not that important. But all of these announcers and media members are so gutless because they don't want to lose their access. And I just think all you're doing is asking. And by the way, Coach, these guys get an off season. No, it's shit. not like they play every month. No doubt. I I just don't get it. And when and I and pretty soon is what's going to happen with with the mainstream media. They're going to start to blame the fans for not having their money wasted. How dare you not support a product? Let me just tell you something. If I was a regular Joe, and I spent couple of sessions of overtime, worked an extra shift, so my son could go to an NBA game and see a particular player. And that player decided, without an injury, to take that night off just arbitrarily. I'd say, son, um, when you get your own job and you pay your own bills, you can pay your own damn ticket to an NBA game. I'm out. I'm out. Look at this. 
Yeah, great. NBA they have, action. It's they fantastic. Haven't they haven't played each other in 11 games. 11 games, these soft pussies haven't played each other. You know why, Steve? People don't want to look deep into this shit. That ain't ironic, coincidence. They're soft, and they don't want to play each other. There's no competitive drive anymore. Do you think Bird and Magic win 11 games oh, playing what? each other? They circled that on the calendar in August when the schedules came out. David Stern has to be rolling over in his grave. I think I told you this before. I remember in the late 80s during the Lakers' Showtime run, 82nd game of the year, they're at Portland. Game meant nothing in terms of seating. It didn't matter what happened. So Pat Riley decides to rest Magic, Worthy, Scott, and Kareem. Just sat them out. Last game of the year, and, and, and didn't mean a thing. David Stern said, oh, no, 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 no. Not happening. He fined the Lakers. He flat out fined the Lakers and Pat Riley and said, we're not doing that here. There was a respect for the game. But beyond that, there was a respect for your television partners and your audience. And that is lost. Honestly, if, if, the, if the next CBA, when that comes up and these guys don't come to an agreement and they have a lockout or a strike, whatever you want to call it, I wouldn't care. Honestly, I w I've said this to Whitlock. My favorite part of the NBA is watching inside the NBA with Charles Barkley. Outside of that, I don't ever need to watch a game again. I agree. TNT is my uh, only one I watch on there. Here, how soft we are, though. This I always say, Steve, you either coach it or you allow it. Look at this video. <laughs> As your favorite, the coach is Look what he's saying. It's on me, dog. The coach, the coach is saying it's on me. How is that on you? <laughs> but where's the head coach? Where's the man in charge? Of, hey, asshole! Come here. Yeah, see that? Hey, I was in Vegas when I was there. That was that's the East West Shrine practice. You know what I would have done? Honestly, hey, guy, uh, you see that goalpost over there? You're doing bear crawls uh, for the next two hours here and back. Um, so, yeah. Or if not, GTFO, get your stuff. You can do it both ways. And you're, it's going to be a terrible look with all these scouts. Because if that's the way you're going to act towards other people, you're a bad guy. we got to start being tough again. I'm being serious. I know, man. I agree. I'm like, dog, when do we become this soft ass? I, I don't know, man. I, let me ask you this. Coach of the year. Why is Andy Reid not on there? <laughs> Expectations. He's Phil Jackson. You naturally expect him with who is considered the best quarterback slash player to always be there. So that almost becomes like a default position. You know, Pat Riley and Phil Jackson did not win the coach of the year many times. Because the talent that contest. they work with and control and mold is held against them. It's a popularity vote too. It's a it's MVP in my opinion is either the controversial guy like Aaron Rodgers for two years in a row, or it's the guy that we all love to hate or love in a Lamar Jackson type. Or it it, it ain't the guy that's the best. Like you're not gonna get the best player. Kobe Bryant got beat out by fucking Steve Nash twice. Like it wasn't even close season stat wise. It wasn't close at all as far as what the team was without or with with that person kobe got beat by steve nash because kobe went through a case in colorado that he had to beat and we all didn't like kobe that's the naysayer public opinion oh kobe's a well i think the year that nash won it the suns had i think the best record at least in the west and the lakers were kind of like the seventh place team even though kobe was clearly at that point post shack with the lakers for about a four-year stretch he was clearly the most skilled best player in the nba I remember years. There was a stretch of time in their careers where when Barry Bonds or Michael Jordan did not win the MVP, it was almost as if they said, okay, we got to give the award to someone else here. They were that good. I remember one year Terry Pendleton won the MVP over Bonds, and then I think Jeff Kent won it, and I thought both years Bonds was the best player. Same with Jordan. Jordan in 1993 had another typical Jordan year but the story that had the most buzz, because it was new, was Charles Barkley's first year in Phoenix, and they gave him the MVP. 
And then when they met in the finals, Jordan just absolutely torched the Suns. I think he averaged over 40 points over a six-game series. So it happens. And Kobe, it happens, but, year, you know, Kobe was up 3-1 in that series, and they lost. The, that 3-1 series, I'll never forget. It was game six. The Lakers could close it out at the Staples. Yes. They had the late lead, and Kwame Brown could not grab a rebound. And then I think it was Tim Thomas shot a tying three to send that game into overtime. I remember watching that game in Las Vegas because I was covering the De La Hoya Mayorga fight. And I said, uh oh, we just lost the series. Again, little things lead to big losses. Yeah, you're right. Um, all right, let me, do, before I show you this, Brady, before you get out of here, because I got to leave early today, too. I got to go all the <laughs> way out your I got to go your way today. Uh, I got a meeting out there with the marketing group. Let me ask you this. Rumblings of Bears are going to are thinking about trading Justin Fields. Um, <laughs> you mean you mean they don't just ru- move him to running back? Neil Anderson two point oh. Uh, <laughs> I would I would move that cat to running back and and, and draft Bryce Young and yeah. trade. I, I would do all kinds of shit to improve that roster. Like I don't know where where you go with this thing if you do trade him or not, but. Um, do you start all over with a rookie quarterback though in Chicago, or or do you? Tr- we got to build this roster. We got to get a better roster. I'm torn here. I'm not a Justin Fields believer, uh, but he is going into year three. I'd rather have a year three guy that started two years than a rookie. Coach, you know what I would do? Um, one thing I wouldn't do, and I can't. I can't wait for you and Salisbury to break. Uh, I, I'm seeing mock drafts with Will Levis in the top five, and I'm like. <laughs> My eyes turn around. My eyes. <laughs> and then um, Anthony I, Richardson. I number two in a lot of them. I'm like, have you guys seen? Look, Will Levis is one of those guys in a shirts and T-shirts will put on a show. Running around. Oh, he's a freak. Throw, yeah, he throw is the ball through hoops. I mean, he's one of those guys in the layup line. He'll do the best looking dunks. Can't put the ball in the hole in the game. That's what he is. I mean, Will Levis is a physical, athletic specimen, but he literally is as almost a big a project as Anthony Richardson. I, I, I'm just telling you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take either guy in the top half of the first round. Now, I agree. I think he is completely uh, a freak of nature out there on seven on. He can throw it everywhere. He can spin it, but in a yeah, game, I, not his with nickname, him. as I like to say in boxing, should be Sushi because he's raw. Okay. Now, going back to the Bears, Coach, here's, here's the thing. If you have a high enough draft choice, you know what I would do? I'd be right on the phone saying, make me an offer. So you're right. If you're a team that needs a lot of different things and there's not that slam dunk Andrew Luck level prospect at quarterback or that number one receiver that you want to take that high in this year's draft, like this year's Jamar Chase, get on the phone and put it up for bid. Try to get a package. You got to give me a first rounder. All right. So, and then we got to swap first. So I have two first round draft choices. You got to give me your first to swap. And then um, I'm also going to need your first. So in other words, end up with two first round draft choices, right? For that one. I need extra draft choices. Or if you can't get a first this year, you got to give me a first in the upcoming year. That's what you have to do. Remember, um, when the Redskins drafted RG3, didn't the Niners basically give uh, have that choice and the Redskins gave them a whole boatload of stuff? You need to do something of that nature. I, I The Bears, to me, you're right. I don't know how it will play to just give up on Justin Fields. And the quarterback that I like in this draft, here's an issue with Bryce Young. Um, he's small. It's a small little guy. He's not that thick. And is he a cold weather quarterback? I don't know. I, I mean, I just think he fits much better in Houston, where at least they play under a dome. Conditions are a little bit better. But if, if you're the Bears, I'm just telling you, with that high number one, I put it up for auction. Hey, put it can, up for auction. Can we give uh can we give everybody coach of the year and everybody MVP and everybody Pro Bowl? Because Tyler Huntley just got named to the fucking Pro Bowl. <laughs> well, they're they're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Nobody, well, they don't even play the game anymore. Coach, 
I remember growing up in the 80s and even all the way up to the late 90s, they used to compete in that game. I mean, those games were good games. There used to be the Hula Bowl, Sunday, it was ABC and then ESPN, and those guys used to play hard. But somewhere around 15, 20 years ago, guys would just say, okay, I'm done. I've been to Hawaii. I want to rest. I want to be with my family. And you're right. That the fact that Tyler Huntley is, and I, when I read that this morning, I was like, what? What? So it's been completely diluted. And the game, the players themselves made it unimportant. But again, I don't blame them because the maybe there was a time because years ago, when the salaries were not as great, there's still a winner share and a loser share for the AFC and NFC. Maybe you needed that extra twenty five, fifty thousand. So that that's the de evolution of what, what was once an actual pretty good all star game. But yeah, Tyler Huntley can call himself a Pro Bowler. Good for him. All right, before we get out of here, we got to show some film. But I, I want to ask you three things. Why is the Sean Payton thing taking so long? A. Uh, where is Lamar Jackson going? And where do you see Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers ending up? I think Arms. both are on the West Coast. After the Purdy debacle and the Niners losing again and Shanahan being overrated as shit, I think that – Aaron or Tom ends up in Frisco and the other one's in Vegas. It has to happen, right? I just oh. I have that feeling. You know, Brady is closer to 50 right now than he is 40. I, I, just, I don't know. I mean, Tom, Tom late in this season looked like a guy who as soon as he got the football – did not want to wait for he just said that is that it, I mean he would just chuck the ball and I'm like Tom, if your heart's not in it and you don't want to put your body on the line, just retire. Just retire. And a lot of what Shanahan does, don't you need a mobile quarterback with a bootleg and waggle action? I don't, I don't know if Tom Rodgers you- can do it at 39. Right, he can do it a little. He can do it. He's still got his legs. But Brady, you know, when you're that when they're doing that outside zone. That backside end can just collapse on the run now. With Tom, Tom cannot move at all. But that right. Shanahan can't run that system. And if he's a, if he's so good, you better change it up. If you want a yeah. guy. To, but see, Tom Brady, he don't have. I don't think Tom Brady likes their roster construction. They don't have. They have Kittle, which is a, okay. You can compare him That's to a Gronk. Gronk. But you don't have the outside guys. You don't have Mike Evans. You don't. Have, has he, he ever has, had an outside tweeners. guy though? He has tweeners. Oh. Well, Mike Evans is a, is, a, is a pure number one, but but no, think about this: Ayuk and Debo. That's comparable to the early run in the Patriots when he had Troy Brown, David Patton. You know, really good slot guys. It's not like he had Randy Moss his whole run. He had Randy Moss for about three years. No, I I know, but you have but when you had Gronk and the Murderer, you are <laughs> you are. You got a fucking problem. You got a double uh, team and commit. Uh, you got to commit everybody to the tight end set. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's referring to Aaron Hernandez, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that's not his name. Yeah. So, so um, as for Sean Payton, maybe he's looking for the perfect situation that doesn't exist. I was actually surprised that the Chargers stuck with Staley and they made their offensive coordinator the scapegoat. So maybe that got crossed off the list. Because if I'm Sean Payton and I say, I want to win and I need a quarterback right off the bat, I'm not doing a rebuild. Los Angeles Chargers were the perfect job. Does he really want to walk into Houston? Looks the Miko Ryan's good luck to him or any other franchise. So maybe Sean Payton takes another year off. Maybe the sabbatical goes another season. Um, Because what's what's left right now? Arizona, Denver, and Houston? Right, and aren't there reports that Sean Payton wants nothing to do with Denver, specifically Russell Weirdo? You know, yeah, I'm wearing that same thing in Arizona. Yeah, I- and yeah, well, look, Kyler Murray makes that job toxic. They should name him Fukushima or Three Mile Island. And the fact that that organization is actually saying to Kyler, hey, Kyler, you're going to be part of this process in finding a coach after you just – Killed off Cliff Kingsbury. Hey, Bidwell, can you get some guts and be the adult? Get some guts and be the adult and tell Kyler, look, we're getting you a coach and he's going to coach you. And that guy's got our full support. Or walk away from this 
multi hundred dollar million dollar contract and get the hell out of here. Seriously. Hey. I, they're, they're exacerbating a mistake by empowering Kyler Murray. I don't get it. Let's uh I know I know how to fix Eric Bieniemy or prove to who, the world who he really is. You hire him in Baltimore as the OC, get from under Andy Reid, coach Lamar Jackson, show everybody you can coach, call plays that aren't gimmicky, and let's see you. Because we don't know what he does. People, he has to get from under Andy Reid. I don't care if he's not the play caller, caller or if he is the play caller. He has to get out. He's being harnessed by all owners because – it ain't a black and white thing. It's because you run a gimmicky system. And if they half the league knows you don't really call the plays, the other half that think you do thinks your offense is gimmicky. And unless you can bring Patrick Mahomes with you, who runs the gimmicky shit, you're not a hireable guy for me. Well, Coach, how did Nathaniel Can't Hack It do without uh, Aaron Rodgers? That's what I'm you saying. Know, and I, and I remember Joe Philman got a head coaching job because – he was around Aaron Rodgers. It's funny. It's almost like the quarterback matters. And <laughs> I I am of the belief that Lamar Jackson and Baltimore are wed to each other. They're going through a rough patch. They're sleeping in separate beds. I don't think one of them has moved out to the hotel quite yet called a divorce lawyer. But, look, when you have Lamar Jackson under center, you've got to go completely all, all in and really – develop a style that's Lamar Jackson style. He cannot do what Patrick Mahomes does. I'm still wondering why Greg Roman was so scapegoated. The same Greg Roman that led him to an MVP season. That's forgotten about. The same Greg Roman whose offense helped win a lot of games. Now look, Lamar had a lot to do with it, but I just wonder, let's say your dream scenario comes to fruition. Um, be enemy public be enemy goes to Baltimore either as the coordinator because it's like Harbaugh's not going to leave and they start running the Mahomes offense wide open and all that stuff. Do you see that working realistically? Do you see that working? I don't. No. I just don't. It's not going to work. Um, it's not going to work. But let me. All right, let's get let's get to some uh, let's get to some shit right here. I got this. Uh, we're going to, let's see how I'm going to put this on here. Um, you're going to get some exclusive Joe Burrow right here, Steve. You're getting some big time shit right here. All right, Steve, let's, let's make it bigger. Um, 230 left, Steve. This mm -hmm. is a Burrow on offense, 230 left, first and 10, all right? Exclusive film right here on the Coach JB Show. All right, so... Um, they're backed up. They got to go 95 yards. Great job. I'm like, holy shit, man. This is nuts and guts. Backed up in your red yeah. zone, in your own end zone. You got to get it out. He makes a hell of a play where the ball can only be caught. Higgins gets a first down. Start. And I'm thinking this game's over. Yeah. Because they're going to take 220 up, and they're going to score in either a field goal or a touchdown. This game was over. Now, let me pause it real quick. I do agree. They ran for 37 yards, a season low. They, the longest rush of the, of the game was six-yard gain by Pirine. They should have ran him more, in my opinion. They yeah. should have used Mixon more in the past game and maybe a couple more schematically sound plays like a draw for him or or a couple screens to Mixon. Um, but... I don't know if – this is two things, Steve, as a, from a coach. If you run the ball, even though you're not having success, you have to run the ball to slow down Chris yeah. Jones because now they're pinning their ear backs and yeah. they're moving Chris Jones all around to kill your horrible O-line that's back. You got your third-string O-line in there. He's killing you, and you guys are pinning your ear backs because you know you're throwing the football every down. You got to run the ball – to control the clock and the narrative, which is pass rush. We couldn't stop. Yeah, and Coach, the Bengals actually called a lot of screens, several of which uh, Burrow had to just spike because they read it. Yes, 
Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I'm giving credit on that, but I just thought there's a particular play coming up here where I thought, you know, run a draw, run some sort of thing. You're going to catch those guys coming up field, and they just kept throwing the ball. Because, And another thing, they don't actually need 90. You need about 60. You're just trying to get a field goal. So yeah, that, yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. Another first down. So they get the first on um, first down. Got a clean pocket. Um, you know, not bad. You got to yeah. like to see him throw that away, but it is what it is. There's time left. Um, he's got a decent pocket here for the most part. Coach, right in a here, situation decent, like that. Decent. Get it out. But, you know, Chris Jones on the backside right. killing the right tackle. The right tackle is fucking bad. Yeah, Coach, um, in a situation like that, I actually like the fact he stayed in bounds and kept it. Because remember, all you need is a field goal to win. It's a tie game. Oh, yeah. I actually want that clock running. Oh, so me that, too. that beats an incomplete yeah. any time. I'm, I'm not mad about that. Um, that one, they call intentional ground yeah. grounding, don't they? Yeah, and it was. There, there really was no. I don't know why. I I don't agree with the intentional grounding because you don't see it called in the NFL late in games, number one. Number two, that right there, Steve, is not intentional grounding. That guy's running a hide route, what we call a hide route from the backfield. And how the hell like is that spike, not the ball? It looked like the ball was spiked down, though, didn't it, though, Coach? But Tom Brady's that... been doing that shit for 20 years. Yeah, looks <laughs> good. I mean, there's there's no way you call intentional grounding on that play right there. Like, you can't, can't call that in end of this magnitude with a running back that is in the vicinity. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, see, people, when you see the real film, people see it later and like, damn, that might have been yeah. closer than I thought. And, uh, People don't see the real film. So now we're third and long, and this is the one I think they get the first down, right? Yeah, they do. I mean, look at this. And, and this is called back. Isn't this called back? No, no. I think this is the third and 16 that they converted, I think, isn't it? All right, they convert this, and then they call the next one back. That's, that's pretty late, Steve. I'm going to be honest. How is that not a Yeah, but again, quarterbacks are treated differently. <laughs> I've, I've said, look, no one How said life was fair. Is that not a penalty four yards out of bounds? Because he's a tight let me, end. Let me highlight this here. Let's see when he hits him. Eh, I mean, that's not a penalty. I know. I wouldn't have got the, the tight end, though, Coach. They're going to be treated I differently. Than I don't know, Steve. I don't know. It's on the Chiefs' sideline, by the way. Here we go. First down. We're getting into your field goal range here. Uh, clock's running. I'm not mad. It's a zero-yard, two-yard game. Right here could have been a good time for it. Um, just after this play, uh, some sort of draw. I just catch some sort of trap. I, I was thinking run the ball once here and shave that clock or make him take a timeout. That's what I was thinking right on this play. That's the one right there. I, All right. Second. Steve, I'm going to pause it on this play right here. I'm going to pause that. Yeah. 47 seconds left. Second down as a head coach and play caller for the Bengals with the football on second down. The Chiefs do not get this ball back regardless of how this drive ends. Exactly. Like, but don't they have two timeouts? They have two timeouts, right? Yeah. But so that's why I'm take saying, at least a timeout. Are they going we'll make... to burn? Are they going to burn two timeouts if I run the football here? Um. Well, I know this. If it was me, I would have made them burn at least one. Hell yeah! I mean, ugh, that one there. I I, I really he doesn't have much here. He's got Chase here. Um, you know, he's got Chase beat across the yeah. middle here, but this is dead. That's dead. Uh, this is dead. That's dead. So you got Chase over the middle. That's basically your only throw in that window there. I just thought running the ball on that down and the, the, the previous down, they had second and three. I guess, hmm. 
Coach, even with the Joe Burrow, as gifted as that young man is, sometimes take a little bit of pressure off your quarterback. Let him hand the ball off and run for three, four yards. It's just so underrated to do that. I agree. Now we're third down. I wouldn't even have minded run and draw there. But right. fuck, don't take a sack. Ugh. Don't take a sack, but and now but the coach, clock run. So you're gonna take your time out right here. But I see that's why I'm saying this right. would have been very, very, very awkward here. Um, because at the end of the day, I don't know if you take that timeout if you make them take one earlier. Right. You got to squeeze the clock. It's an art form. Is to not only manage your offense, is but to make sure the other the other offense just has to take a knee or they don't even get the ball. That's what I'm thinking. Sometimes I just run the ball to run the ball. It's not even about the yardage because I truly believe this. When it comes to game and clock management, sometimes yards are more important than anything, but sometimes time is more important than yards. And that was one time I'm like, Zach, I know you're an offensive whiz guy. Just hand the ball off. Keep it simple. And, Coach, what followed after that was a punt right down the middle of Main Street. I didn't understand. You're telling me if you're not Zach Taylor, the special team coach, you tell your guy, hey, boot this towards one of the sidelines. <laughs> I, that thing, I'm just telling you, for as much as the Bengals can bitch and moan, a lot of this was caused by themselves. Let me ask you this. Before you get out of here, I got to get out of here, too. Uh, I was at the uh, East-West Shrine. Bilicek was there. I got to speak to him. Arthur Smith. A couple guys were there. Um, I heard from – and every NFL scout in the, in the world was there. Every team was represented. And I got to hear a couple things, interesting takes. And I told Sean yesterday. I heard the Kelsey brothers playing each other is a priority – one a b andy reed playing his old team is a priority don't be <laughs> if this has been set up for the last six weeks <laughs> so i hear this and i'm like yeah 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 and then i see how that game ended steve and I'm, just, like, I'm not a conspiracy guy i'm not into the whole refs call you know all that i don't think new york called down and said hey Throw this fucking game. We need the Eagles in this game. I don't think that happened, but I, I just I'm looking at it closer now. I kind of I'm, I'm I'm leaning on the Matt McChesney side of things that he thinks that he when he played in the league he saw referees throw games. He said that I have not seen that or or, or ever felt that way. Um, I'm starting to see though certain things because I'm watching this game man, and there is some questionable shit. I've never seen a third down replayed. Where oh, the, that was ridiculous. The ref that calls it, though, is coming north of the football play off the other sideline. I've never seen that in my life. Usually it comes from behind the QB with the play clock. I've never seen the north. I've never seen that mechanically. I've talked to a couple of buddies of mine that are referees. Um, one of them's a higher up, and he's like, that's not the mechanics. And I'm just like, dude, why is this not fucking being talked about? I, I guess – for you, it's like finding out you're part of the Truman Show. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, what do I do? I mean, that I'm just telling, that game was one of the most poorly officiated ones I've ever seen. And what may, really makes me upset, why don't any of the announcers call it out? It's like they're all housemen. Oh, that call, well, that's the rule, that's a good call. I think they're all scared that after Troy Aikman said put a dress on him, he had to apologize. It's not a part of the approved messaging. So these guys are afraid to step out. That's what I like about Charles Barkley. He'll flat out tell you, boy, we showed you a terrible game. Or, man, that guy was really bad tonight. Or that officiating sucked. No one else does that except Sir Charles. And in the National Football League, it's almost like all these guys have to parrot uh, certain lines. But, yeah, I, the and, and, Coach, I'm just saying – the way they can call roughing the passer or unnecessary roughness now on the targeting call or hits that are simply too violent, you can get a rogue official to swing a game, a flag here, a flag there. It doesn't have to be that obvious. It can be very subtle. I mean, if you saw that Netflix documentary on, on Tim Donahue, 
the admitted game fixer, the NBA referee, it'll open your eyes like, oh, I see it in boxing all the time. All you have to do is give one round to a guy that may have not won it or another round. And in a 12-round fight, you could say, yeah, yeah, it was a close fight. You know, one guy won seven rounds to five. Knowing in your own mind you gave two rounds to the wrong guy. The best crooks and criminals are very subtle. They're well, not they're that priest, open. They're priests and politicians. Right. That, there's a reason why when you rob a bank, um, you don't take an Uber and you wear a ski mask. You still have hey, to plan it out. Here, Kelly Moore, good fit in, in Charger Land with Herbert or uh, no? Well, according to you, because he's too soft, no. But in terms of opening up the offense and if he has both receivers, um, that thing can produce a lot of numbers. But I will say this, to your point, coachability is so key. I believe that's the best thing about Tom Brady. When he was at New England, they yelled and screamed at him. I knew a player, Quatrine Hill, played at the University of Miami in the early 2000s. He, he, he said the greatest thing he ever saw from Bill Belichick was in the middle of spring camp. They're right outside of uh, Gillette Stadium. First year that uh, Randy Moss was there in 2007, and Tom Brady, in a regular drill, in the middle of April, throws a one-hopper. And he and and Quatrine says, Steve, you would have thought we lost the Super Bowl because Belichick just screams out, hey, Brady, I can get someone from Foxborough fucking high to make that pass. Get your – and he got on his ass. Like, it was like – it was like that was like a third-string walk-on. So the horn blows for the next drill. Randy Moss had just taken two years off in Oakland, not being a pro, right? So everyone's crossing the field, and Quatrain's in that group jogging over to the other station. And Randy Moss had a look on his face, and Randy Moss was saying, wait a minute, yeah, uh, you, you guys treat – y'all do this to Brady? Y'all, y'all treat Brady? And, and everyone said, no, no, no. Brady's the first one to get it. Yeah, He's the first one in line, and he always accepts it, so none of us slap dicks can ever say a word. And I still remember a game where um, in Washington, this is years ago, Brady threw a terrible interception at Washington. Bill O'Brien comes right over to him and said, hey, well, that was bad. Brady tries to say something back, and I'm just telling you, Bill O'Brien turned his back and he came right back in his face screaming at him. Bullshit, you're not doing that here. I don't care who the fuck you are. And you know what? Brady took it. That's why you don't. That's why yeah. Kelly Moore scares me. That's why this new age yeah. coach scares me. This right. new age coach, period, right. scares me. Right. You have to have the ability to get on a – you know, they asked Emmett Smith one time. I was on a, a football life or whatever. No, it was America's game. They asked Emmett Smith, Emmett, did Jimmy Johnson ever get on you? And Jim is like, what? Of course he did. What, are you crazy? He goes, Jimmy, as much as he would treat us better – he knew he had to get on us, me, Michael, and Troy, because the rest of the team would learn, wait a minute, if the three most important guys on the team take that shit, we have no say. I, I actually I actually think your best player has to be willing to take a verbal ass whipping once in a while. Phil Sims tells stories that Bill Parcells would come up to him at practice, and he'd be like, hey, Phil, yeah, what's up, coach? Uh, I'm getting on your ass today. And Phil be like, why? He goes, I, 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 Phil, you know, I give you breaks. I'm going to make this up to you. You can be late once in a while. Let you go golf. I got to really get on your ass today because I'm trying to send a message. So don't take it personal. But today you're an asshole and you're taking it and we're all going to be better for it. It's part of the job. No, I've, I, I know coaches that do that and they set it up even, even with coaches. Um, they right. set it up with their staff. Uh, Pete Carroll used to be a guy. He's like, hey, you're the goat today or you're the, you're the duck. <laughs> he, would, he, would, he would call. And then he would. In staff meetings, I've been in a few. He he would tell Ken Norton, and uh, at the time it was uh, it was uh, goddamn, who's the running back coach that was uh, oh McNair, yeah McNair, you guys are going at it in stretch today, and I'm telling you, it was so legitimate, like they were going to fight that the players were like fuck, like yeah. they, and, and Pete Carroll would pick the sta- uh, two different staff members from each side of the ball every day. <laughs> <laughs> They would talk shit every day. That, that kid Norm would talk shit to Norm Chow and, and Lane Kiffin and, and and Sark. And then Sark would have to pick a fight yeah. with fucking D-line coach. Like, it was bad. It was, and the players were on edge. Like, fuck. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing with Herbert. Herbert's got all the natural physical attributes that you want. But there are times, I think, that he gets loose with this technique and his decision-making isn't good. 
So the question then, because if Kellen Moore ever wants to be a head coach, I agree with you. The, the label of being soft or a nice guy, because that's going to perennially hold him back. Because then he becomes the modern day Norv Turner. Norv was a brilliant offensive coordinator, was never quite that tough enough guy as a leader. Hey, but uh, McCarthy now, by getting rid of Kellen Moore, mutually parting ways, whatever they say, he's now basically saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to sit on this sword here either way. I got to win a Super Bowl as the play caller. He's going to call the plays like he wanted to do when he took the job, but apparently convenience, quote, unquote, we're going to stay convenient and allow you to have Kellen Moore so we're comfortable <laughs> in this whole thing. Now he's going to say, basically told Jerry Jones, hey, listen, I'm going to call the plays. I want a Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers calling the plays. I'm going to call the plays the head coach. And if we don't win it, fire me. And then Dan Quinn, Dan Quinn's sitting there. Coach, isn't that the rule, though, when a coach who's under a little bit of fire, even though, to be fair, McCarthy's won a lot of games, but the expectations are different in Dallas. But when a head coach fires an assistant, that generally means, okay, (laughs) next one up is you. You're on the spot. Right, so McCarthy's now in the spot, right? Oh, it's it's he's a, he is all in. <laughs> he's, he's all in. At least get to the championship out. game next year. You got to win the championship game. Opinion. I mean, Super Jerry Bowl Jones, bust. Wow, he's got to win a Super Bowl, right? He's he's a cadaver walking around this fucking place. Do you? I wonder if Jerry Jones, old Jerry, in the deepest recesses of his mind, in his most honest moments. I wonder if he regrets running off Jimmy Johnson because I think he believed after a while, after the first two, then they won the third two years later, 95 with Barry Switzer. He probably thought, you know what? This is easy. This is easy. I I can win a Super Bowl every couple of years. I I know how to do it. Said we should have won five or six Super Bowls. I I, I wonder if Jerry Jones realizes what he did. I'm going to be honest. I think they win six Super Bowls. Coach, you're frozen up on me. No, that's you. Yeah. You know, uh, Troy Aikman says the greatest regret of his career. What was that, Coach? You there? Coach, can you hear me? I hear you. Do you hear me? Coach. I hear you. I'm there. Can you hear me? I hear you. Your your video's out. Yes, I do. Coach, just wanted to say one thing about your – Hold on for one. Let me come back. Steve's internet's bad. He's got the Asian coach. So he's got the Korean coast cell internet working. Uh, I know he wanted to say something, so he wants to come back. Uh, Steve's going to call back in. Um, I know Steve's got the Korean coast cell internet. He wants to call back in. I know he wants to say finish up. Yeah, coach. Uh, Troy Aikman once said the greatest regret of his career is all the success came in the first five years. He said, as good as my first five years was, the last five or six were just as bad. Um, and he said the lack of discipline throughout that organization, um, that he missed Jimmy because Jimmy could play the bad cop and he'd play the good cop. And then he, Troy said, once I had to become the bad cop, it just ruined it. And so that's why that coach, I think, is, is so key. It's not even about football sometimes. You just got to be a good leader. And you got to be able to set ground rules and you got to be steadfast. And so, you know, McCarthy is putting it all on him. And this will be interesting because they still have to sign Tony Pollard. They have to make a decision with him. Um, But it's all in, all or nothing. But I think Jerry Jones realizes that decision he made 35 years ago still has ramifications today on that organization. Hey, Craig Middleton said Tua over Aikman. So, and what? Not at football. At what? Hey, Steve, we just found out who is with this guy. Craig Middleton in the (laughs) chat is the guy that this guy is hiding out. So now we know who the fuck is that guy. So now Craig Middleton. By the way, Craig Middleton, you're being blocked because I think you're a bitch-made troll. So bye-bye. Um... Steve, man, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I can't wait to see you for the Super Bowl. Uh, we're going to have drinks. Uh, oh, I can't uh, wait. I can't wait. I might be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to be there for all the pregame, all that stuff. I right, might be uh, drunk before uh, the first kickoff. Hey, 
Hey, everybody in the chat's asking about Mario Lopez. They're saying, do you work out with him? Uh, I've worked out with him in the past. Our schedules don't uh, really align. But, yeah, we worked out in the past, go to the boxing gym, hit the heavy bag. He does all that jujitsu. T- he's dumb enough to actually spar and do all that stuff. I, Let I'm me be honest him. with you. I know that's your boy. There's no fucking way that A.C. Slater is going to beat my ass. No, but you're a lot bigger. But I'm just telling you, I don't think people realize he was actually a good high school wrestler in Chula Vista. He actually could have gone to college, and he still does all that jujitsu, and he gets hit in the face when he spars, and I keep telling him to quit. He can't help himself. But the guy, he can fight, though. For By Hollywood standards, he's pound for pound. Hey. So you know. Hey, it is what it is. Uh, man, I appreciate you coming on. And, Absolutely. Uh, I got to go watch Whitlock. I didn't see it. I know, I know you're on there. I wasn't on there yesterday, so I got I to gotta go back and watch you on there. Um, I know they had to touch on a few other things. But they yeah, I'm on the me. last segment. I'm on it at about three hours and ten minutes. It was a marathon show. Whitlock was the talk of the town last week. <laughs> he had to address a lot of things. So uh, it's a long show. Make sure you, uh, you have that punched up. And uh, we'll do this later this week, Coach. Appreciate you. All right, brother. Appreciate you. I'll see you later on. Uh, Steve Kim, uh, appreciate him. Chop it up. Uh, go check out Steve Kim um, on Whitlock. Uh, they had an episode yesterday. Uh, that's why I didn't go on. They uh, had to clear up some things because Whitlock was taking heat in social media about the uh, the young black kid that got killed by the black police officers. Uh, he was on Carlson and all this other shit. So, you know. It is what it is. I don't get into all that politics shit. Uh, that's my deal. Don't talk politics with me. I ain't going to talk with you. I'm not a political guy like that. But I will tell you, the next time I'm on, I know I'm going to be talking about Patrick Mahomes. Um, well, I got to get ready to get out of here. I got to go to a meeting, man, in L.A. So I got to take a hike and a drive. So I got to go get me a stick and some yak, even though I won't drink the yak as I drive. But I will smoke the stick. Uh, appreciate everybody coming in here. Hit the like button. Subscribe. If you're not a member of Slap Nation, become one on the Discord today. Uh, go on over to CoachABStore.com. Get you some merch. And... Uh, I will see you tomorrow morning, plus tomorrow evening, last chance Q. Uh, Sean Salisbury and I are going to break down some Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, and some more Jalen Hurts all week long. We're going to break that film down uh, and get you ready for the Super Bowl as we'll break down the Super Bowl quarterbacks uh, for the next two weeks. Um, Appreciate everybody, man, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, It's been great. Hit that like button, subscribe. And uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow, God willing. Peace.